the uh, Tuesday, May 10th, first meeting of the Charter Review Committee. Uh, I have heard from Molly that she will not be here tonight, so there are eight members present. So we have two sets of minutes to approve tonight. Uh, one is the public forum that we held on April 30th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Any changes, additions? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimously approved. And then we have the minutes from our May 7th meeting. Motion to approve. I just make yes. a quick, it's very minor, but um, in the graph of the building, I was present to bring attention. I'd like to just get, out, get rid of any item of great significance and just say attention to section 93 of the charter. Okay. okay. Could, can we have a motion to approve that first and then, okay. and then a second and then we'll discuss it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh. Robbie wants to delete. Uh, Under public comment, yeah. second graph. Was there a second to the motion? Yes, Robbie. Robbie. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, you want to delete the phrase to an item of great significance. Right? I mean, that's, those are his words. Yes, those are his words. To my, to my recollection, those are his words. Uh, um, we need to get rid of it, or we could add to what he called an item of great significance. Either or. I mean, he, he then, then he stated that, and yes. he was trying to explain it. So. Yes. Just either or, it's not anything. What would you? I prefer bring attention to uh, section 3. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the amendment is to remove the uh, phrase an item of great significance. Any other discussion on that? Those in favor of removing that phrase? Aye. 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 I abstain. One abstention. Uh, any other discussion on the minutes, additions, changes? Those in favor of approving the minutes as amended? Aye. 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 Any opposed? One abstention. That's uh, approved with no blame abstaining. Does, does anyone in the audience want to address us during the public comment period? Committee members have updates they want to bring to the attention of the entire committee. I don't have any updates. Um, I just wanted to bring back what I passed out a couple of meetings ago, which is the chart that gave me a change of the back. Um, and it was naming the remaining cities that still have an elected, an elected city clerk. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is, and it doesn't have to be tonight, but at some point if I could get some feedback, if I were to look into this more, what kinds of questions um, members might want me to ask of the cities that still have um, elected city clerks and their reasoning, if, if anybody thinks that that's in any um, Necessary. I mean, I have my own opinion, thoughts about this issue, but if I should do more um, research, I'm happy to. Uh, so the, the question is, what additional research do we, do we want uh, Robbie to do on our behalf? And then also, what who do we want to hear from um, on this issue? Do we want to invite uh, city officials to address the question of appointed versus elected city clerk? Mm -hmm. um, Bill? One, one of the problems that presented itself, and I think we touched on it when we first opened, was the, uh, the embedded conflict that the city clerk has in presiding over their own election. Mm -hmm. um, there is some latitude for smaller communities, but not for cities. Um, so when talking with other cities, I'd be kind of curious to see how they 
address that issue of the established co conflict of presiding over their own elections. Okay. Other thoughts from on this issue? I'm not a committee member, but I do have a question. Are you planning on speaking to any appointed clerks? I mean, you know, we, we have an experience with an elected clerk. Right. What we don't have is experience with an appointed clerk. Yep. You know, and some of the questions you might um, pursue would be the extent to which they have to feel they're any pressure because they're, you know, part of an executive branch as opposed to an independent elected official. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that this was controversial. Uh, Excellent. Uh, when the charter was last uh, reviewed, and uh, it seems to me to be a significant enough issue that we'll, we'll, I think we want to schedule. I don't know that we necessarily have to have a, a separate forum. But I think we want to schedule some dedicated time at one of our meetings, publicize that, invite. I would think city officials. Let them know it's eager to hear from them. Former city clerks as well. Sure. And which there are several who are yeah. yeah. Perhaps lo local appointed clerks. Right. I mean, Amherst has an appointed clerk. Yeah. Does that make sense, people? Okay. And I'm thinking that this is another sort of big picture issue that we ought to. We have to do that sooner rather than later. So I think that maybe one of our meetings in June could be largely devoted to that. Does that work for you, Rob, in terms of doing some research? Yes. All right. Why don't we um, Why don't we plan then uh, to maybe our second meeting in June, which is. Uh, June 18th to deal with the question of the appointed versus elected city clerk. And um, uh, maybe Robbie, you and I can, can, we'll, we'll confer about if there's an uh, appointed local clerk that we want to invite. Yes. Okay. Yep. Mr. Thank Chair, I, yes. I just talked to our city clerk and she's going to look at the clerk's association website to see if there's somebody at the clerk's association, you know, the state clerk association, who might have some valuable information. Yes, I appreciate that. And, and Pam, do you have other thoughts about who we might hear from? Well, I think, you know, the, the, uh, the Mass uh, Massachusetts Municipal Clerks Association as well as the Massachusetts Town Clerks Association, so those are two um, points uh, or contact that you may want to reach out to. Um, but I think there's a, you know, there's a good mix of those, uh, obviously, in, in the surrounding communities that you could talk to. Barbara Lombard is, is an elected um, city clerk. In uh, East Hampton. For example. I mean, uh, she's an, did I say elected? I've been appointed. She's, 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 appointed. she's an appointed clerk in East Hampton. Right. And a uh, clerk in Amherst who is name escapes me. Yep, Margaret Nardowitz. Uh, she is also appointed. We can either or both of them to come in time. Do you suppose it would be relevant um, to examine the relative st staffing uh, capacities of elected versus appointed as regards administering to elections? That is to say, is either an elected or an appointed clerk more likely to have election commissioners at her disposal? Um, I don't know that that's particularly germane to the issue of elected and appointed, but it is germane in my mind anyway to the issue of what our, our clerk may require staffing-wise going forward with these other election initiatives that we're talking about. Um, 
Uh, do you think that's something that the uh, the Mass Municipal Clerks Association representative could speak to? Staffing patterns? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, my own personal perception on it is that the cities that have elected city clerks will have an election commission because it's the election commission who actually runs the election. So I think that that, that may be the, the distinction between the board of registrars that we have that help us you know, to oversee some of the election activities, but not necessarily the election itself. It's actually the city clerk defined by our charter, that's the chief election official. Well, that's another question we could ask the appointed clerks who come to speak to us about that. And I think the idea that Bill suggested of uh, inviting living former city clerks in your court is, is also mm -hmm. Wendy, uh, Wendy Moss and Chris Skrupski, I believe. Is Adeline still there? She is, yep. Yeah. Okay. Is she? So there's three. All right. That's the, that's the three immediate predecessors to Tina. Right. the budget has to be presented and then also all audit review um, and whatever problems that have arisen as a result of that Lynn and Susan are both pretty aware of it. and those as far as the council's experience on the ground it hasn't been problematic but I know that in the mayor's office that there there's a lot of scrambling that has to be done in order to meet all the dates and so, but yes, I think um, Susan having her come to speak to that or a memo from her possibly would be appropriate. The two issues that, that I recall are one, whether September 15th should be moved. That right. Should be, that date should be moved earlier than September yeah. 15th. Right? Right on that one? Okay. And then the, the question of whether a three year contract is optimal. I, I couldn't tell you one way or another whether it's optimal or not. Um, we've been doing one-year contracts. We've been doing, but we were I thought we were transitioning to multi-year contracts. I don't think that. I mean, it says that the contracts be awarded each year. <clears throat> okay, so it's it's a. Insofar as it goes, the process by which we've done the appointments, uh, this time was not too exhaustive by any stretch. It was there was a certain urgency <coughs> that was sort of. And we felt comfortable going forward with Scanlon. 
the year previous to that was a much more involved, uh, maybe two years previous to that was much more involved because we did review other, uh, other bidders. Three-year contract would be fine. I honestly, I can't, unless of course you end up with an audit agency that turns out to be terrible, in which case you're stuck with them for the remaining two years of the contract. But the basic, it's not a huge pool of municipal audit, uh, auditors, so and by and large, I don't think anyone's spoken of any problems within the auditing system so far. So I don't, I don't see a problem with establishing a three-year contract, but the fact is we're making law not based on the existing agencies that are out there, but ones potentially in the future. Um, you know, I'm sure this amendment is in, in search of a problem. I yeah. Mean, I, 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 Bob, did you have a question about whether the uh, three-year versus the one-year contract was well, I can tell you that it's it's no fun to be breaking in new auditors every year. Yeah, yeah. that's your experience. Yeah. Um, uh, we we had three year contracts, but there were termination clauses, right. not for cause. So, you know, if you wanted out, you could get out. But but I I certainly, from a practitioner standpoint, would say that a three year contract makes a lot more sense than a than a one year. The beauty of it is is that. For instance, Scandal this time, each, the data points that they choose to analyze, they don't, they don't fine tooth comb the whole, the whole structure. So that what they do is they actually pick and choose principal parts, but each time they do it, it's a different part. So you will get a different perspective on certain um, departments that you wouldn't have otherwise had. So to what Bob's recommending that would give them a three-year plan in which they can lay out how they're going to analyze holistically the entire system. I don't see a problem with that. If the finance staff is challenged by the calendar now, having to reorient a new auditor every year is not going to make the calendar any easier. No, well, that's, that's true. That's true. I mean, it's not described under the law, but always the assumption was if you had a new auditor, that you would stick with that auditor provide they were providing good service and stay with that order until such time that you felt it was appropriate that the council felt it was appropriate to have a new set of eyes again. But defining it under this gives you some flexibility, certainly with a three year contract the auditors get a better sense over time what they can what's the best way to approach the city. It gives them you know a little more flexibility in their review. And, and to Bob's point, you're not breaking someone else in. But basically, we're talking about two different auditors. <laughs> so there's only two. That, so uh, the only two that ever bid it for us in the field. Yeah, yeah. and that is that's the other problem. You do want to change auditors yeah. every now and then. You don't want to have the same auditor every right. year because they'll just make the same mistakes every time yeah. if they make them. So. Well, I'm just revisiting the questions that you raised earlier. Does it make sense to ask Susan Ray if she has any uh, recommendations on uh, the change of date? And um, if she has any, um, you know, she'd like to say to the three-year question. Can, can, can you um, ask her to, she doesn't need to, I don't think we need to hear from her, but if she would uh, reply to that, those questions, that would be useful. Okay. The other question um, that I want to raise is section. Good. Um, just one more other thing. Do we, um, are we going to address the September 15th date? Because that need that definitely yes. needs to change. Okay. Yes. Yes. Those are the two issues. Yes. Okay. September 15th, an earlier date than September 15th, mm -hmm. and a three-year versus a one-year. The other question I wanted to uh, check in on is section 3-7, temporary absence of the mayor. Uh, we talked about this early. Um, we agreed that some language uh, would need to be clarified. Is that something, Lynn, that you're going to bring forward to Yes, us? I haven't. We have not identified the perfect language that okay. we um, but yes, that but is you're something. working. You're, yep. you're working on it. Okay, that's in your bailing group. Yep. Okay. Great. 
any other any other things we can remember? Yes, Bill. I, I don't know if it's appropriate, and in, in, in my apologies for not being here at the last meeting, but I did notice that uh, uh, Attorney Newman had brought up one, some points that have generated some interest in discussion, and I, I want to address that briefly. Well, that's, Bill, that's the uh, it's on, that's on the agenda, discussed okay. suggestion by Attorney William Newman. Well, let's all, I'll save it for then. that. I think that would be a great, okay. great time to respond. Okay. Right. Prepare your thoughts carefully. That's, okay. a big, that's a big request. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Next two items are um, are language changes that are uh, largely housekeeping. One of which will be uh, should be very familiar to everyone. Uh, uh, we have the Forbes Library Trustees uh, is the uh, process for filling vacancy vacancies on that board. Uh, Again, before us, this was tabled at our last meeting, so we need a motion to take it off the table. So moved. Second. Those in favor? Those no recusing himself. Okay. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, it should be noted that Dylan Gaffney, a uh, employee of Forbes Library, has removed himself from the table and will not be participating in any discussion or vote on this item. The um, bill, the, uh, we, uh, we delayed a vote on this to work out uh, final language so that it's clear that, that while the trustees of the library will appoint a person to fill a vacancy, that at the next city election, the next scheduled city election, that vacancy will be elected. A uh, person will be elected to fill that vacancy to serve remainder of the unexpired term should that exist okay and not not establish special election requirement in, in that case correct, correct. Uh, so uh, you have the language on the agenda there are two further changes to that language uh, uh, one is in the first sentence Whenever a vacancy occurs on the board of trustees under the will of Charles E. Forbes, the president of the board, the Forbes Library the Board of Trustees is headed by a president rather than the chair. And the third sentence should be persons appointed by the trustees to fill a vacancy rather than elected by the trustees. Is there any, uh, any further discussion by committee members on this? I know, the, uh, I know Russ Carrier is back here. Do you, is there any more, Russ, that you want to say? Are you satisfied with the, the language that you have spoken <coughs> about? So subsequent to your meeting, the city sent us some wording, and we weren't quite sure about the, the changes in the middle that you know we were having. Just trouble trying to figure out what they meant. Mm -hmm. So we turned them over to our attorney and um, subsequent to that they talked to the city solicitor and pretty much came to an agreement but I understand that there's at least one more tweak uh, they, to this. They may be. Yeah, and the trustees have, are, we haven't seen the final wording and our meeting isn't until uh, this Thursday. Uh, so we haven't even, you know, we haven't even seen what the final wording um, looks like. But we're obviously pretty much on board with the uh, uh, spirit of what we're trying, both sides are trying to do here. So I don't even know what the other change is that um, the city solicitor is talking about. It was a, a single word change like, like appointed. I thought there was another elected in there, but I can't find it. It's, uh, it's right after the next sentence to, to an office built by appointment. Right, but that is the candidate that was elected. <coughs> mm -hmm. so that's that's correct. The way it is. So 
I guess the gist of what I'm saying is whatever you, you know, decide, I, the, the trustees would certainly need to sign off on this, and our meeting is not until Thursday. And the city solicitor indicated that there was going to be another... Pardon? Another a need to come back for another meeting. Would that be necessary, given the, I think what Russ is expressing, the sense of general consensus is a consensus, and if there's any other legal detail that's not significant, it seems to me to have these guys come in one more meeting. Oh, I mean, yeah. I would, what I would do is, I'll, I'll find my notes, and I will communicate to uh, Attorney Lucentini what it is and let him advise them as to whether they need to come back. I'm suspecting that they're not going to need to come back. It, is, it was a very minor word, just like elected to appoint it. It was one of those kinds of changes. But I'll, I'll just have to take up find my notes on my desk and try to put them in the file. Seems like we have a kumbaya moment and go for it. I'm not sure what the committee wants to do about allowing um, the trustees to have a look at this. That's, that's completely up to them. Committee. Well, I think the trustees already have a look at this. Well, well we're going to, we have to, we would have to approve the, the wording. And so I, I assume if the wording is fine, uh, that they'll, they'll approve it. Uh, but we don't know what the wording is. Uh, there's, there's no requirement that the clerk agree to elected versus appointed. There's no requirement that the library agree to whatever language you're going to recommend to the city council, if any. Um, there's no tech I mean, I, I would understand if you wanted to hear from the trustees. I'm not telling you not to. I'm just saying very technically, the trustees, there's no requirement that, that any agency or any independent body approve what you recommend. But I would think you would want. Right. No, I, I think to the extent that we're all feeling around, not completely in the dark, but we're feeling around for something that we we're all in general agreement with. Same goal. The same goal, same objective, clarity of language, black and white lines defined. I, it seems to me that uh, we hear from the library and they don't even have to show in person. As, as the solicitor said, we're not creating law here. We're not even creating policy. We're making a recommendation and many months from now. So there's plenty of opportunity to make the adjustments and modifications and I think all I'm saying is that I think maybe you guys charge up these stairs one more time. I don't think it's necessary. Right. And I assume if we if we see the words, then we're it, you know we'll probably it's a, you know it's only Tuesday. Our meeting's on Thursday, so Perfect. we'll still have a chance to see that those words and if they're fine. That's Perfect. Mm -hmm. And if even if you had a concern, you can send it forward in a memo as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. Do we suggest that we go ahead and vote on this tonight and get, get it off our plate and that that one further yeah, there may word, wording change will be an amendment. We can, we can amend it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, handle that. Okay. And you'll communicate that to, yeah, I'll to, 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 to the Forbes Library representative. Attorney. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? The motion to approve it as written. As, well, as with the, the two wording changes, chair becomes president, elect becomes appointed. Yep. Okay. Those in, uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. Those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Patty abstains. Okay. Six in favor, one abstain. Okay, the other, uh, uh, while we're discussing uh, procedures for calling vacancies, the other is section 4-6, uh, the uh, filling of a school committee vacancy, which involves joint meeting of the city council and the school committee. The change here is intended to address a question that was raised by school committee member Alan, who um, said she believes that it's unclear, the current language doesn't make it clear whether uh, the, uh, the vacancy 
vacancy will be filled by um, the majority of those members of the city <coughs> council who are present or the majority of those who are on those bodies. So the suggested change then is, is simply to, to add the phrase, uh, well actually it's, it's to, to, to make shall choose, shall elect, and to add the phrase by majority vote of those present. I believe that mirrors the existing practice. Is that right, Phil? Well, Pam and I were just talking about this on discuss this with Sam. We actually made this up. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> well, Pam and I, when the charter first came into effect, actually had to make this up because there was no process that was prescribed in, when, when we did this. And, but that's true. This reflects what the process by which we did it was the majority of the vote of those present. And it was done in multiple rounds. Well, in this, it was planned to be done in multiple rounds. We didn't have to do it in multiple rounds. But <coughs> we structured it so that I mean, actually a variant of ranked choice voting in some way. But, um, but it, it, did, it meant, and the intention was, and the practice was, the majority of those present of both bodies. So, um, and everything else, all the other things that we did, we basically had to make up, as I said, because there wasn't any system. So right now, whatever system there is, is the one that we cobbled together. And, and this then cut. <coughs> and, this, and this jives with that, okay. so it's fine. Okay. Uh, and, um, <coughs> I know that adding this goes along with what we do, but do you see a need that, to add more information in there based off what you guys did? It's interesting because, yeah, I mean, normally I would say let's just do it in the <coughs> the rules, but it's not the council rules that take precedence here, so it may actually have to be in this. A, a process by which nominations are made and the vote is cast. Um, this doesn't go into that level of detail, but it, 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 one is soliciting nominations, soliciting people willing to put their names forward for nomination, how the mon nominations are presented, <coughs> and then the whole tea ceremony. I, it may be too detailed, yeah, I but think there's that no place to actually uh, uh, that is much too detailed. Are we going to do that for the Forbes Library? Also, right. we're going to prescribe right. in the charter how they recruit. Although, to the point, somewhere it should be embedded so it doesn't become one of these kind of well, this is the way we always did it kind of things. And somewhere, it, I think it should be actually. And I don't know where because we're talking about a joint committee in this case, right. um, where the rules are defined by which this election is conducted. So. You know, you could put in a sentence that the uh, that you know, the procedures by which you know the procedures would be defined by ordinance. There you go. That's true. You could establish by ordinance. The procedure for for elections, special elections by the joint bodies. Mm -hmm. When those come up, and now that you were talking, you know, the same thing with yeah. Smith right. vocational. You know, that just allows it to be changed more easily, but not be so loosey goosey that it's just, you know, this is the way we've always right. done it. Right. I had brought this wording to Pam, and she had and a couple more edits okay. in it as well. So, in the fourth sentence, um, the candidate elected to an office filled. Striking elected to an office filled and replacing it, replacing it with chosen. So it would be the candidate chosen by appointment prior to the election, and then adding, as described in this section, <coughs> shall be sworn to the office immediately to complete the then unexpired term, and then striking in addition to the term for which elected. Can you, can you read that again? Yeah. So should I read what the actual sentence would be? Yes. Go ahead. So the candidate chosen by appointment prior to the election, as described in this section, shall be sworn to the office immediately to complete the then unexpired term. That's clear. Sorry, one more time. Sorry, there's nothing. 
The candidate chosen by appointment prior to the election, as described in this section, shall be sworn to the office immediately to complete the then unexpired term. city election for this seat is going to be the next city election yeah. so this seat's going to be on every city election unlike the, the four like where you know it might or might not be well my, my question is why chosen versus elected because that person in that sentence has been elected by the voters and i think it's clear in the way it is right now the way it stands now, but. This is the suggestion of Pam. <laughs> My understanding is it's, it's not chosen by the voters. That's special election. This, this, no, this is the joint. Yeah, this that's is, what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, it's the joint city council. City it is council a form of an election? Yeah, but no, they, we've always referred to these things as elections. So it does require nominations and Votes, but I find it very confusing election. because it talks about you know the person elected after the person elected by the joint committee. No, I agree. It's that's very why, confusing. That's why, that's why I tried to change the language. Um, I mean, you could say library. instead of saying chosen, you could say selected by the joint body. Or the candidate appointed. Appointed or that's what you selected or chosen by the joint body. So it clarifies what type of election this is. It's not a general election. This is a special election of a joint body of representatives. But isn't this, isn't that sentence speaking to after the person elected by the voters? Yes. Yes, it is. It's not. Yes. Yes, it is. The candidate elected to an office filled by appointment prior to the election. So the person that was the appointed. Elected. See, this doesn't make okay. a lot of sense because it's, mm -hmm. because the, the, they fill the unexpired term in addition to the term for which elected, weren't they elected to fill, uh, are, they, are they filling the, the unexpired term and another term? Yeah. And they were just elected, out, you know, and they start serving immediately, they get sworn Oh, I see, oh, okay, the, un, the unexpired term is from right. November right. to right. January. Which is right. why right. I like the language, in addition to the term for which elected. Right. Mm -hmm. Because technically they, their term isn't unexpired. Uh, yes. They get elected, say, it's November 5th, they would be sworn in that night or the next day. Okay. I and think, yes, yes. I think the, the, the wording change that um, is needed is in the, the previous sentence. Persons elected to fill a vacancy by the City Council and School Committee shall serve only until the next regular city election when the office shall be filled by the voters. There, if you want to change elected to appointed, Persons appointed to fill a vacancy mm -hmm. by the city council. Places where um, 
you know, the city council shall establish by ordinance the salary for the office of the city clerk. I mean, there are other places where the charter calls out for an ordinance to sort of fill in the details. Okay. I have no objection. So the, the process by which the election will be conducted shall be established by ordinance. Shall be conducted by the school committee. By the joint council. committee, yeah, by joint committee. Sure. Actually, the process by which. The process and procedures by which. This, uh, these special elections. No, what are we calling it? It's, what's the special category of this? This is called uh, uh, draft one by committee. Yes. <laughs> um, we are creating God, I mean, if we, uh, Well, the section is simply titled Filling of Vacancies. Okay. The process by which the election to fill a vacancy be conducted will be defined <coughs> by ordinance or established under ordinance or whatever. Council and school committee shall fill vacancies under this section shall be established by ordinance. and school committee shall fill vacancies under this section shall be established by ordinance. I'm about to type this up and send it to Annie, so she'll scribble it. That's great. What was the first one? The first change was, is what's on the agenda? First change is what is on the agenda, yes. Okay, and what Sam had read us, we're not using. No, no. no. It was, all that was changed then was what Sam had changed the previous sentence and said, instead of saying persons elected to fill other vacancies, Okay. All right, we need a motion to approve those three changes to section 146. Second. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Oh, we need a roll call on this one, please. Stan Moulton? Yes. Robbie Sullivan? Yes. Bill Gaffney? Yes. Sam Hopper? Yes. Bob Bullrays? Yes. Patty Healy? Yes. Wayne Simmons? Yes. Yes. Okay, then Okay, now we are um, going to uh, discuss Attorney uh, William Newman's suggestion made at the last meeting to add language to Section 1 3, Division of Powers, specifying the legislative power of the city council. And uh, 
he sent a written summary of what he said, which um, all of you should have. That was sent to you by the end with the minutes of May 17th. I know Patty had an interest in this, and Bill was not here, but. Uh, I've had several conversations about it since then. Yeah, so. Um, we hear from Bill first, then? Do, do, do. No, I think I, I wanted to bring it up because it, it seemed reasonable to look at what the role of the City Council is um, and whether, in fact, the City Council has the authority to make certain changes um, in the city. And I, I'm confused about whether, but, and we didn't have, we didn't really have a discussion about it at all. He brought it up and you know, left and that was it. But, um, my, I'm not looking at changing the power balance and making the you know, change completely changing the power balance in the city, but rather understanding how the city council operates in, in not the day-to-day -day working of the city, but when there is an issue, a, a problem or an issue that's brought up by the city council, are they stymied by the language? because they are not to um, say never exercise any, exec any executive power. And Alan was telling us that the executive branch, uh, the mayor, uh, administers all of the, the, um, the city, city agencies, agencies, departments and agencies, departments and agencies yeah. in the city. Mm -hmm. And I, I, don't, I wasn't here to give the example that he brought up. Um, he brought I asked the Trust Act. People. He was concerned about the Trust Act, which basically establishes as a sanctuary city. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, all right. That, maybe that was one thing. Because right. I, I actually came in the middle of his okay. commentary. So um, so uh, what I wanted to know, and, I, and I, I'd like to hear from the city councilors about it, because it, it seems that if the city council um, believes that a certain um, policy should change, but but it's the policy is um, completely um, administered by a city agency, and only the mayor can dictate to that agency how it will function and what it will do, what the policy is. Uh, is, are there examples of where the city council, in fact, isn't able to um, uh, to fully um, make changes in policy because the mayor controls all of the functions of the city departments? And well, if I could speak to that. Yeah, yeah. So that. that's my question because I didn't really. So, first of all, one of the things that. Bill alluded to, at least in his letter and, and at least in five minutes, was um, there is no established or vested power of legislative authority in the, in the charter for the council. First of all, I want to address that. Um, and the irony is, of course, Bill was saying that, you know, the city council can't create ordinances, and the irony there is that Bill was part of, for instance, the Cameron debate which was an ordinance, it was by law. It wasn't creating policy, it was a law. As Alan will tell you, the reason that the council had authority over that was warranted creating policy for the police department or any other department, dictating law for the public way, which is what we do have oversight. Now, we have the unique legislative authority. The mayor has the executive authority. We can't do executive stuff, the mayor can't do legislative mm -hmm. stuff. We can propose stuff and we can say, yeah, sure, sounds good, we'll do that. And we, we do do that. And we, on the other hand, can make recommendations and proposals about policy issues, but can't dictate them. And he can go, yeah, well, maybe I'll do that, maybe I won't. The Trust Act, which was, not, which was a policy directly affecting the police department, no other department, and it was uh, the the reason there were other communities with different structures, Cambridge, for instance, did this, they have a completely different structure from us. Um, not completely different, but not the strong mayor we council structure that which we have. Legislative powers, while not described in the charter, doesn't say the, the 
council should make law because it's a given, because under Mass General Law, what is it, it's uh, Part 1, Title uh, 7, Chapter 43, Section 120, says, the legislative powers of the city shall be vested in the city council. We have, we make laws and rules relative to the public way and the public's experience. The, the, with the issue with the Trust Act was we were, trying by law to dictate a policy for the police department, mm -hmm. which at that point, and still does, come in conflict with their separation of powers, as we understand. Mm -hmm. But the mayor instead, in fact, actually, as the council and the council sponsorship were hacking this out for the better part of seven, close to eight months, the mayor just said, oh, the hell with it, I'll just do it, and created a policy. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, Law has more durability, all, or arguably, than policy. Policy can change at the whim of the mayor or the executive, whoever the executive is, and that was part of the concern, that uh, another mayor could get elected and change that policy. But then the same thing stands. Another council could get elected and change that ordinance if it were an ordinance as well. So, I mean, they're all subject to vulnerable um, uh, attack, if you will. So Bill's understanding of the way the charter structure, I, it was, I was kind of surprised, at least the way he's described it. He, he knows better. I think he knows better. I think he was a little confused, but he actually knows that we do make law. We are not just figureheads. We make significant law. And then the camera one's a perfect example because that was law that the mayor has the right to veto. Mm -hmm. and, we, and his veto was not sustained. We overrode his veto. And it is now it is now municipal law. Now, depending where you come down on that case, one way or another. But the fact is that the council did assert its authority in dictating municipal law on an issue on the public way. That's a significant power and authority. And on the checks and balances part, um, this is often a debate, even debated when we were um, approving the charter, as to how much oversight we have. Now, back in the old charter, it was very ill-defined. We had counselors who believed that, they, that we had a city committee that was in charge of all city property and, and thereby also certain city agencies. We had uh, at one point a counselor who thought, instead of being on the police committee, thought he was on the police commission, that he was allowed to dictate policy and regulate how the police functioned, even what uniforms they wore and stuff like that. Um, that was, those lines were made a little clearer, more, a lot clearer when we did the new charter. And it, there, it, that still does not come without a certain sense of how controversy. Did, so how did the, what did the new language, what was the new language that changed? I mean, I'm curious. That it it, that it, it clearly defined, well, part of it was that we had established historically a number of committees and, and commissions. The Board of Public Works, if you think about yes. it, was a body that could actually level levy fees, they were not elected. It was taxation essentially without representation. Right. It was essentially a, 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 a good-hearted, decent citizens getting together and figuring out what's the best way to proceed on, a, on something that actually should have had municipal rep elected representative oversight. Whereas, so now, we set the water fees, the council mm -hmm. does. The mayor petitions for what he thinks they should be. The council approves and sets the water fees through a series of hearings. The back in the old days, the council had virtually no play in this at all whatsoever. Um, we had to clearly define those and make those terms. And then property committee thing was the same thing, disposition of the municipal property. And that still comes under the aegis of the finance, the financial fiduciary oversight of the council. But those are more clearly defined. They were really loosey-goosey, and lots of people interpret it any way they wanted to, and it created legal problems that we're still dealing with. I mean, for instance, there are stop signs that have no business being where they are. There was one counselor traded off the property behind this building uh, with, with, the, with the church, with the UU. They, they basically said, if you give us the property for that sidewalk, we'll give you a free parking space. A couple of free parking spaces. They had no authority to do that, but they did that, and that happened like 40 years ago, and we're still dealing with that issue. Who owns what property now? Mm -hmm. So with the new charter, 
the whole idea is to try to avoid those those types of conflict as they evolve. And I think Bill's interpretation, I think what Bill is asking for is more council influence and authority over policies within departments and departmental policies. And that would include planning, I would assume, and it would include, uh, which we do have influence insofar as we approve all the zoning laws. All those zoning laws come through the council and they have to be voted on. Um, but what constitutes a department, how the department functions, that comes under the executive bill, I think would like us to have more influence than that. And I think it's important to point out that while this, the mayor gets to organize the departments, he can only, or she can only do that with the approval of the council. So the mayor establishes what's called administrative order, organizing the departments, and the council approves it. Or not. Council, or not. And so, um, there, you know, there is, uh, it, it's not like the, the council has no authority when it comes to the agencies of the city. But once the agencies of the city are established, and I think maybe Lynn can speak to this better than I can, um, uh, there's a lot to, there's a lot um, that goes into the stew of deciding how these agencies operate because there are staffing issues. Some agencies, Maybe the council would know that you know some agencies or some departments are down a number of employees, and so adjustments have to be made. Um, and so, knowing exactly how much money is available at every moment and and staffing—that's all stuff that has to be done by the mayor. And well, that seems administrative. Yes, that's I, executive. I, what executive? That's executive. Yes. Yeah, so I guess. Uh, I don't know. My question is, when he brought up some language that it was intriguing to me, and I don't know if city councilors think differently about uh, or, or agree with a language or a more of an expansion of power. And I, but I, like I'm thinking, um, if I was, I was trying to think of examples myself, but I'm not a city councilor, so I, you know, I haven't. I don't have that experience. Um, if the Board of Health makes a decision that, that they want to, well, you know, no smoking, and, and, and there were a few issues around that. So if the Board of Health decides that they want to, uh, that they think that they should appoint someone to do a certain uh, health-related job in the city. Well, that's, the Board of Health is, an interesting example because the Board of Health is one agency. They have actually technically craft law without being elected. Uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, the Board of Health can establish a smoking ban in downtown North Haven. Yeah. Does not come before the council. The council has no authority that, over that is whatsoever. Is that in the charter? Or I just don't and that, and that's, that's actually state law. That's state law. Okay. That's state law. And it, it, you know, it comes so from the, the Board of Health is the most powerful yeah. board in any city or town. Hands down, by far and away, with the least accountability. It, it, that's that's it's problematic, but it's not something that has anything to do. You'll notice Board of Health is not mentioned in our charter. Anymore. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because we have no authority over that. Mm -hmm. We have appointing authority, but that's it. Mm -hmm. We can't. We can't. Um, and, and, and so, as an example, they're they're that's a they're the anomaly. Okay. So that's not and a it's, yeah, and they're the anomaly. Um, well. So let me just okay. suggest one of the issues with, with the proposed trust ordinance. Mm -hmm. The trust ordinance purported to tell police officers what they are going to do when they stop somebody. Mm -hmm. okay. That is policy that's made by the police chief. Okay. Mm -hmm. Police chiefs and uh, so if, if, the, if, um, if the city council can get to the granular level of what a police officer is going to say and do in a particular situation, um, now you have the city council operating agencies because they can tell, um, they can tell Lynn how she should deal with the mayor, she can tell Annie how she should deal with the license commission, why not? But maybe not operating the agency, but the uh, city council could um, say that we are not, our community is not in the business of stopping immigrants on the street. And, and they passed a, they, they passed a resolution right. to that effect. 
We did do a resolution. But that wasn't, right, yeah, I remember those hearings. Uh, yeah. But that wasn't. Um, doesn't carry the weight of law. Doesn't carry the weight of law and doesn't establish policy. Um, it's, so it's, it's, it's an it's, aspirational document, so okay. it doesn't really have uh, authority. Other than the authorities. So you but other than dictating, you know, agency employee mm -hmm. policy, the city council is involved in a vast array of <coughs> city mm -hmm. um, city policies, zoning policies, as we know, how buildings, you know, what buildings are going to be yeah. used for, public ways. I mean, it, it, Bill, Bill's experience was in the two examples that he cited. The cameras and the and the mm -hmm. trust ordinance were um, that was heavily debated, and it was right after the new charter when the trust um, the trust act came up. Right. And what we were using as as, as template was unfortunately the I believe it was it was the Cambridge it was the Cambridge ordinance. Do you remember? Um, and and Cambridge actually has a slightly different structure, and, and they they. Uh, their mayor is elected from their body. Mm. They have a they have a, a city manager who is a professional city manager, mm -hmm. and then their mayor, the who is truly a figurehead, mm. is elected from their body and serves. And then what's just similar structure? I think is Framingham moved to that type? I'm not sure. But they're now a city and they're they they have we are a strong mayor week council. It's an unfortunate title and name because it automatically invokes a sense that you have essentially a bunch of sycophants bobbing their heads <laughs> and commandeering a, a strict Not authority. But, but what it means is that the authority to administer, to be the administer, or the executive authority, lies in one body. The checks and balances we don't necessarily reflect, see reflected in the federal level, certainly do play out in this level, at least in my I know that actually my colleagues don't all agree with me on all of these points. There, there are some concerns, for instance, the issue of uh, hiring a separate solicitor. I think uh, mm -hmm. Councilor Klein's already made that recommendation, and that's been that's come up a number of times. Um, as as far as the issue of creating policy, I, I, we have the means by which we can impel policy, but not require it. Mm -hmm. And we can we can uh, in the checks and balances part we can start to push the mayor in a certain direction for that. Mm -hmm. The mayor can't make law. He's not allowed to make law. Yeah. The mayor can recommend laws, as I said, but then that ultimately comes up to the council. Do either of the other two councils are here want to weigh in on this issue? Um, yeah. I'm Jane share I'm the board for city council, city council vice president. Um, we actually have sort of a fascinating example that's happening. Councilor Klein and I both sit on the Committee of Community Resources, and we just met yesterday, and we looked at six different pieces of zoning. Five of them were around um, marijuana cultivation and sort of the new laws that were creating around this new industry. And so it's, it's a kind of a special example where we have something where we're creating law and policy together, and um, we're not changing something or we're not revisiting something. We're really saying, how do we want to do this? And so these are on the recommendation of the mayor, but we spend a lot of time going over them with Carolyn from the planning department and tweaking them, demanding more information, um, and making amendments to them, and really thinking about how we want to establish these laws that are really setting policy for how we're going to handle this new industry. We're in. So I just thought that that was kind of a good example of how, um, one, how policies, I mean, laws coming on the recommendation from the executive, but that we um, are the ones that have to pass it. And we do often spend a lot of time changing them or thinking about it. So if and that committee decided that, uh, the city council decided that there should be a limit on the number of uh, marijuana dispensaries, and um, or limit where they would be, uh, and that was a decision that the city council made but the mayor disagreed, what happens to that? How does that process work? Well, so when we, help me out though, how, when we, we did the- When we put it back came up, yeah, we, when we had to establish before we could actually have lead sales, we actually had to establish the terms by which um, mm -hmm. we would do that. And we decided not to go, the council decided and the mayor agreed not to go with limiting. Uh, 
there were members who suggested eliminating the amount of vendors. And so, but my question is whether or not you agree with the So if the mayor, if the mayor objected, you disagree. he would veto it. He could he veto it. it. He could veto it. At which point it comes back to the council and a supermajority has to approve it to override the veto. Mm -hmm. So a simple majority allows it to become law. Not zoning. Not zoning, that's true. That is zoning that you're required to have a supermajority on zoning law. So, but but in, in a super majority is required to override the mayor's veto, mm -hmm. and so the the mayor does have he can't change the law, he can't do anything about it. He can just say that I'm not going to sign this into law. If he doesn't sign, it, doesn't veto it, you know, after a certain period, he will automatically. Sign. So in reverse, if the mayor doesn't sign the veto, then you really want the law. Yes. So then what happens? He wants and, and the council says no. It does not become law. So the final, final check is to say it comes. Right, absolutely. And in zoning, actually, if you can pass it, you can override the veto. Right. <laughs> you need a two-thirds vote for both of them. So, um, you know, the city council really is the final say on zoning. Yes. I will be supplying Ward 7 city councilor. I think that we're, we're talking here as if um, policy versus legislation, there's some very clear definition of each and that that they're kind of in separate separate places so that you know we as the city council pass legislation and the executive branch um, enforces policy, enforces operational um, actions and policy in departments. But I don't think it's really that clear, and I think that's where it gets fuzz fuzzy around, around power imbalance. I think that <clears throat> the city council legislators create legislation that policy then needs to get formed within departments to carry out legislation that has been um, made into law. So, for instance, um, Bill referred to the fact that we have the right as a city council to make law around what happens on city streets. We decided that there would not be surveillance cameras put into our downtown. Um, what does that mean though? That means that the police would then have to um, figure out other ways. They'd have to create policy that doesn't include cameras. That, that's a bad example because I'm talking about something that doesn't exist. But let's say we had decided to vote on putting cameras into downtown. That would necessarily mean that policy would have to be created whereby the police department had to interact with those cameras. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there is a false um, rubric being created here around legislation versus policy. And I think that that's a slippery slope into um, legal rulings that say that something is um, the jurisdiction of the executive branch, when it shouldn't necessarily be, in my opinion. I think the Trust Act is a good example because I think the Trust Act um, was a way for the city council to say, we want to be a sanctuary city. We want to be a city that will not hand over our immigrants to, to the federal authorities. We will not give information to the federal authorities about immigrants in our city. Yes, that would trigger the need to create policy for the police department about how they would then enforce or not enforce what we're asking them to do by creating law. Um, I didn't agree with that, actually. I, I mean, I think there, there might have been problems in how the trust act that we took, which actually came from immigrant uh, advocacy groups nationally, so it was, a, it was a template that some cities adopted. Um, and Cambridge was one of those cities, but it didn't come from Cambridge, just to clarify. So there might have been, you know, tweaking that needed to happen in terms of what our trust, the Northampton's Trust Act looked like. But, but I think that we absolutely, as a city council, should have had the jurisdiction to create Northampton as a sanctuary city. And then it would have been up to the mayor, perhaps, to create, to write an executive order that would tell the police department what their role in that was. So I'm not sure how the charter can make those, um, kind of parse that and strengthen the city council's ability to 
create things that are truly legislation and can be and should be legislation versus um, executive order, kind of executive administration of departments. Does that, am I making sense here? And I, I think it, nobody's saying yes, so I'm a little worried that well, maybe yeah, I'm not making yeah, sense. It does make no, sense. I, I understand what you said. And I think that it very much depends on, and this is actually, this dovetails into the question of the city council having access to an independent attorney. Um, because Mr. Seewald, um, attorney Seewald, has to kind of make a decision about the kind of fine points of something like that. And if members of the city council don't agree with those rulings, I think that we should be able to have a, a council that we can call upon that can kind of look at issues and um, so that we have the ability to have some pushback. I know that the city solicitor um, represents all branches in the city of um, how the city runs, but I do think that we need sometimes to have the ability to call on another um, legal opinion. And I know we can go to the AG's office, but that's a whole other bureaucratic process. Um, and it, yeah, there should be some way in which we can actually call upon a counselor locally to um, interact with our city solicitor around this question of what is in fact um, legislation and what is policy. Could, um, for the example that you're using, we actually did do that with Bill Newman, ironically. The, uh, and we do. So the question was whether to have a full-time two separate city solicitors and purpose of discussion, it's not just, because we do have the right to hire, and we have hired separate attorneys for the council to represent the council. I've represented the Alan council. Alan represented us <laughs> in the court as a city solicitor when we're able to bar students. Yes. And um, uh, so, so I think that's the question is whether to have a full, to give the council the opportunity to have a full-time city, their own solicitor, um, versus part-time solicitor with with the trust act. I mean, the irony there also with the trust act is that actually we were close. You're right. It was a nuanced thing, and we were on into month eight, and the mayor actually just finally said, "I'm just going to turn into policy and render half of that moot." I mean, we could have, and in fact, there was, as you recall, there was an ordinance that was moving through. Uh, uh, we had another attorney, Councillor Adams, who was an attorney at the time who had um, was supposedly doing more research to, to make it a little more bulletproof as it went through. But um, once we passed the resolution, the mayor established the, the community as uh, a trust community or sanctuary city, then I think, as I recall, it just sort of petered out. The, but the fact is we were still pursuing, originally pursuing, um, how we could actually make an address the nuances that Council Klein was referring to. Um, how do you couch the language as such that you're not dictating policy for a department, but you're actually talking about law for a community? So, Can I give one other example? Just, I think it's, it's helpful to kind of illustrate what um, a situation like this could look like. So we just um, passed legislation to create a, a resolution, actually, to create a select committee on pesticide reduction for the city. This is a um, committee that will do research, look into possibilities for how the city can reduce um, the use of pesticides in the city. So let's say this committee comes up with a recommendation, I'm just totally speaking off the top of my head, um, that they want to ban glyphosate use in the city, so round, ban Roundup use in the city. Essentially, so that would be a recommendation that would be made to the city council. If the city council decided that it was in fact going to pass legislation that says that we are banning Roundup, the use of Roundup in the city and municipal areas in the city, you could, that could be interpreted to be setting policy because it's what the DPW is the is the um, or the department that would um, would use or not use Roundup in the city on municipal areas. So, are we if we were to pass legislation like that banning the use of Roundup, um, could it be that the city solicitor? I'm not as I'm just. This is all hypothetical, theoretical. Could the city solicitor say, well, in fact, you can't pass that legislation. You can't do that because you're telling the um, the DPW what chemicals they can and can't 
issues. You're setting policy, internal policy for how they manage turf in the city. So, and there are several cities across Massachusetts that have in fact banned particular pesticides in municipal areas. Um, but that's a concern that I have knowing that, um, you know, there is this kind of way in which it seems that our city goes around what is policy versus what is legislation, what qualifies as um, telling departments how to operationalize um, particular practices. Very hypothetically, because <laughs> no one's asked me to research this, and I haven't really thought about it, but the city council does have authority over municipal property. It's different than directing a police officer what to say to somebody who takes into custody, or what to do with somebody who takes into custody to make a policy about how we use our land. That's your, that's, that's your bailiwick. It's so, different. We're gonna get into like quasi-legal <laughs> argument because I'm clearly not an attorney and I'm not very articulate on these things, but- No, you're you being know, very articulate can, and you're, you're, can you're picking Can we tell big police <laughs> that if they're stopping somebody on a municipal street, that they can't turn them into ICE? You know what I mean? Like I just think that, that well, that's we're not, doing that's legal not, parsing here. No, 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 no. That's not land use, okay? You control, you, you make policy as the land use, the zoning, all of the policy as the land use, you can, you make. Now, of course, you can't ban glyphosate in the city. You can only ban it on city property. Because, uh, yeah, I probably but, shouldn't have brought up concrete examples because then we're getting into kind of figuring well, out. Well, but, 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 but you see, that's, that's exactly how this works. It, it depends on what policies you're making. And so some areas, the legislature, the state legislature, has carved out for city councils very specifically carved out for city councils and controlling municipal property is one. And there's very few that you're not involved in. And the day-to-day -day operations of departments and policies around departments is one. Uh, I'd like to give other community members a chance uh, to weigh in on this issue if you care to. Just that I, I don't, I think I have a hard time with Bill's language when it, when he says the right to prescribe the goals, that the legislative branch would have the right to prescribe the goals of the department or the city agency, but not the day-to-day -day operations of the city agency or an executive power. And I, I don't, I can't make the connection that you said, the council could set a goal, the only way to reach that goal is by doing those day-to-day -day operations. So I guess I don't, I think they contradict each other. And I, I don't support this, this change. Of course, you're referring to Bill Newman's Yes, language. yes. Bill Newman's language. And um, I think, I'm sorry, no, just to ahead. add one more thing. I also think if I was putting my um, hat on as a department, and I would struggle with who am I, you know, the council sets this goal for me, but the mayor is my, you know, overseer of day-to-day -day stuff, and so who am I supposed to be appeasing at that point, I guess? And I could see there being conflict at some point um, with who they were supposed to answer to on a specific item. Mm -hmm. I'm super reluctant to bring up an issue that's been settled for a long time, but Alan, it just, you reminded me of it. We had an issue with at the senior center with handicapped mm -hmm. parking, and which I think the council viewed as planned, mm -hmm. and um, the administration viewed differently. Could you explain a little bit why that's? Right. I mean, I know it's part. It's a parking lot for a city department. Right, and you and but. you make the policy that this is a parking lot for city um, uh, for city parking at the senior center and the law requires handicapped spaces. The city council doesn't decide where the handicapped spaces go. That's the executive function. You have made the policy about that parking lot that it is municipal parking for the senior center, and as such, it needs X number of handicapped spaces. It's not for the city council. And I also, I know that the city council does all this parking stuff. When I review the city, or like a lot of what you do is parking. I, you know, it's not an issue that the mayor really wants to take up, but I wonder 
why the city council is deciding exactly where parking. This is municipal parking. We're going to have metered parking on Main Street. Does the city council have to decide exactly where the meters are going to go? Well, that's an executive function. You decide the policy of parking at the senior center. The mayor decides how best to lay out the parking lot. That was my point. Was that an issue for the city council, though? I mean, that seems straightforward. I, I remember it being a number of handicapped parking spaces as opposed no, to. No, 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 no. It was definitely location. where the location of the handicapped spaces. Definitely, if, if, if there is a an ordinance establishing how many handicapped parking spaces, I think that's included within your jurisdiction. But where they're going to be, how best to lay out the parking lot, I think that's an exactly the point. dispute. Yeah. Actually, state law and federal law dictates the need and necessity of handicapped parking and even how approximate yeah. to the systems has to be. Right. I wanted to speak to some of the other points that Bill had mentioned. Okay. It's, it's just a... Okay. No, I'd love to hear it. It just seems that it's... it's it, it would, that the city council wants to be able to be involved on a moment detailed level when it wants to be, but not when it's not going to, uh, when it's not important to them. Right. Um, and, and, and you need, there's, I don't really see where there's a way to write language for that um, without making every issue uh, fraught with, with just, uh, if you know what I'm trying to say. Um, there, I think there needs to be a, a clear line. Uh, Absolutely. Well, I, I think or nothing's going to get done. I think it, well, you're absolutely right. I think, and first of all, the tension that we're describing is actually built into this. It's, you're going to have these tensions. Yes. Uh, there's going to be the conflicts, and it's actually the part that I relish. It's kind of grotesque, but <laughs> I think that when we have the debates over over where jurisdiction and influence occurs, that's Better place to have that is on the council floor, mm -hmm. and then, or between the two, to the two authorities. That's where it should happen, and shouldn't. If we describe every possible potential conflict and the myriad of ones we couldn't possibly can envision, it's we're going to get we're going to get to a point where we won't need a municipal government. We're already be, already be defined. Everything will be defined in the in the charter. So I these kind of ambiguities are going to exist, they should exist, they create this kind of tension, it shouldn't be so ambiguous, there should be a clear line in which, for instance, uh, an adjudicator could fall back on and say, this can, this is how this is. And sometimes it may go to court. It has gone to court. And, uh, and I, I don't think it's avoidable in some cases, and I also don't think it's wrong. Um, the, the difference between this charter and the old charter is night and day. How we understand that we're going to conduct polity is much clearer now, um, despite the ambiguities and despite some of the frustrations. And it's a power struggle, basically. So, uh, you know, and, and, and that actually brings me back to Bill's kind of points is that the other charters that he was referring to, it's interesting that he read the other charters more assiduously than he read ours. But the most important part is the fact that most of the language that he's referring to or expressing concerns is actually most of that's all embedded or established by state law. <laughs> and the mayor, for instance, we can call the mayor anytime to come address us on any issue. Um, and then we can also make requests to the mayor to have department heads come speak to us. We have to, there is a process by which that happens. We can't. Instead of having us call up individual departments and tell us this, tell them this must be so. And again, that was in the old days. Councilors would just call up and say, "I want this, this, and this of a department head." And to Lynn's concern that she expresses, "Well, who am I? Who am I paying? Who am I supposed to pay attention to? Who's my boss here?" And we had department heads who were doing what was required of them by the administrator and then suddenly being told by nine other administrators what they should do, um, including coming in 
explain to the public policy, the, the policy in, a, in a forum in a gym somewhere, which is completely wrong. If we have questions, we can invite uh, the, the head of the DPW to come speak to us about any issue uh, by sending a request via the mayor. The mayor, who just happens to be, but is not required to be, almost virtually at every meeting anyway. Um, and if you recall, the old structure had it as the mayor presided over the meeting, which, thinking back on that, is really bizarre. You had the mayor presiding over this body that is supposed to have this division but the mayor basically got to control the debate, manage the debate, and set the agenda. It was the mayor. Um, that was one of the bigger significant charter changes and that now that the council is its own agency. And the mayor comes by our invitation. But the mayor will come at our invitation to describe. So he's referring to that in, in Chicopee. Yeah, well, we were doing it long before Chicopee did, just to say, not for nothing. Um, and then he refers to provides that the city council shall have the right to hire its own attorney. Again, that's embedded, it's understood. We can hire our own attorney should the occasion arise or should be necessary. Uh, we actually had that discussion. <coughs> we, we did, we did, although there seems to be some, some uh, differing opinions among the councilors about uh, whether uh, they, they, in fact, uh, can hire their own attorney. Lisa has well, expressed this. Mm -hmm. To us now a couple of times. Well, one important feature is we don't have the budget. Right. Yeah. It would have, the, the mayor yeah. would have we to, to approve the would have to submit a um, financial order to appropriate money yeah. to hire a lawyer. Which, as I said, has been done when we small town hired out. But yes, it's, uh, so the East Hampton Charter uses the same as uh, language as Northampton on separation of powers. They also have a provision that Northampton, once again, doesn't. The East Hampton Charter provides subject only to the express prohibitions in the general law or the provisions of this charter. The city council may by ordinance recognize, create, merge, divide, or abolish any city agency in whole or part and prescribe the functions of all such entities. And that's the one that I think is the most significant that he's suggesting. Um, as opposed to that, the mayor proposes to the city council the organization of the agency. It's not really that different. And I think it's very dangerous to have a city council who does not have the, you know, if a, a finance, finance director helping them, doesn't have the staff to even know how best to organize these agencies. There's just no way that the council could do that. And I, I was shocked to see it. and. I'd be shocked to see it in, in, in action. Can I clarify? Yes. I feel like um, you've descended into something that I by no means was trying to say. I absolutely do not think the council should have jurisdiction over departments, tell department heads what to do. I did not say that, and I don't think my um, what I was saying implies that. I mean, it's, it's a 101 kind of a management of any structure that you know you don't give someone two bosses. Um, clearly the executive branch needs to manage departments and department heads. I have no interest in getting into granular at all. I don't think city council necessarily should, although we do around things like parking and, and uh, land use and zoning and things. But what I do think is I, I think a city council should be imbued with the power to create um, philosophical direction for the city so that we should have mechanisms by which legislatively we can say this is a sanctuary city. This is a city that um, does not uh, condone uh, wage theft. I mean that was another one where we had some real issue when we um, wanted to ensure that um, we weren't responsible for wage theft in this city and we crafted some legislation that essentially was telling particular departments how, I can't even remember the details Tell at this the point. Tell the License Commission how, how to do, yeah. you know, what to include in its, its licenses, so telling the... I don't want the City Council to be writing the details of how City Departments or the License Commission mm -hmm. is carrying out that work, but what we should be able to do is legislate broadly saying 
you know, this is our vision. We don't, we want to make sure that we are never, as a city, as a municipality, committing wage theft, and then it becomes the executive branch's duty to then figure out what that will look like department to department to department. Mm -hmm. But the way in which things are decided presently is almost always, you know, if, if we're trying to set some kind of philosophical direction for the city, and, and things necessarily have to get granular at some point, and um, it's just at what point things do become granular and it becomes the executive branch's responsibility to figure out how to operationalize something that we are voting on as a city council. And that's where I think there's an issue. And I don't know if it's just a case by case kind of thing that we have to figure out with legal advice, whether it be our city solicitor or um, another attorney, or if there is a way to write a charter, and I would have to look at examples, and I, I mean, I, I'm hoping that you guys are, are you know, able to look at other examples and find ways in which that can be done. To more specifically define the, the term legislation and, and, and what, what powers the city council has then to set those kind of philosophical goals. That's what you're asking. Yes? I think there, there, there are two issues. One is um, as simple as adding a sentence to the charter stating that the city council has the power to make and establish ordinances, which it does. And that's set forth by, by state law. And um, that would not conflict with state law. It's a question of whether it's redundant and whether there are other things that state law establishes for, uh, for the city, that within the purview of the city council that, you know, that it should also then be stated in the charter. That's question one. The, the, the other is, is what Elisa just expressed, the, the broader question of what is the legislation, uh, what, what are the parameters of the city council's establishing legislation that, that sort of set forth the philosophical goal that then department heads and city departments use as to guide their policy making. And there's a second line that he wrote that was to create the uh, right to prescribe the goals, responsibilities, and functions of a city agency. Just Bob? Yeah. Well, I, I think I, I take a broad view of the legislative power and ability of the council to determine how things are going to occur. They have the right to describe how the city is going to be run. Uh, the matter of, of determining then whether goals and objectives and procedures and policies reflect these legislative statements they also had the ability to weigh on that, in my view, during the budget process. Because the council says, this is what we want, and then the mayor comes back with a budget that says, in essence, this is how I'm going to get it done. Now, you know, I've worked under lots of different budgeting systems in my time, but all of them have some sort of goal statement um, capacity whether it's management by objectives or whether it's quality circles or whatever, whatever it is you want to call it, the essence is someone's asking for money in order to do a certain thing. And when the mayor presents a budget to the council, in essence, he's saying, this is how I intend to run my agencies in order to, count, to carry out what you have expressed in ordinance um, and in other resolutions, your desire to see how the city is going to be run. So the, that's why I'm really dubious about Attorney Newman's second statement. Because to make anything more specific about creating agencies, prescribing what their, what their policies are going to be, prescribing what their goals are going to be, that is clearly an executive function. Um, but again, in my view, the council's ability to be impactful on what the various agencies are going to do 
is a budget function. But the only thing about the budget is that the city council can only recommend decreasing the budget, or, or um, it can't uh, amend the budget, or. Um, what the city council needs to know is what the budget's going to do. You're asking for money. What are you going to do with this money? How many what what how many potholes are you going to fix? How many what miles of roads are you going to um, create? How are you going to treat and purify the water? Um, I mean, it's not to me. It's not a function of, of how much or how little. It's what you're going to do with it. And is that? But they don't have any they decision have any over how the budget. They can say no to the budget. They can say no. If they're so not they, happy with if the city council wants the school department to have a bigger budget. They don't and the and the mayor comes in this year and says, "Sorry, we're gonna we're gonna level fund." All the city council can do is say, "Okay." They can say no. And, and, and actually, that absolutely, I mean, this is one of these issues where we have influence on authority, but the fact is, is that we do have significant influence in how the budget is structured and where we prioritize how much of our municipal finances go into school and all the dimensions of school. And so right now it's around 63% if you take everything into consideration. If the council uh, has influence over the mayor, and pressures and push and says we want more. We want to do 70% mm -hmm. of the municipal budget. Now the mayor would say no, go pound sand. But the fact is, is, is to Bob's point, we do have influence, and this is not unprecedented where we can say um, we can cut an entire department. It, it's a strategy. Right, you can cut. That's yeah, all but you it's can. a strategy. But say you cut a department that the mayor particularly approved, uh, wants to see. Uh, it's a strategy. It's a political strategy. Right, it, create, it does wield some effort and it, it, it has some force, and it's not necessarily the best way to conduct no, these things. No. But I don't see you doing it. You do. You do <laughs> we are not powerless. I mean, we're not figureheads as far as that goes. The, the, uh, which is why the mayor is obliged to come, as Bob said, and break down explicitly the aspects of the budget and hopefully it corresponds with the the goals and the objectives that the community shares um, the school department's a perfect example now first of all since it's such a significant portion of the budget it's required by law to have its own elected body to oversee its budget separate from the city council um, the, and the fact is that you have two agencies, in which case that the mayor has to struggle with, essentially, to, uh, mm -hmm. to draft that huge segment of our budget. So it, it's not, it, it, in this respect, it's not necessarily co-equal, and I think that's what some of people were talking about, in terms of having co-equal uh, in that respect as far as budgetary issues go. Um, and that's true. I mean, Strong Mayor Week Council does not allow for co-equal budget decision making. But uh, at the same time, also, we can't hire our own finance director. We can't, we don't have the oversight of the departments and the day-to-day -day operations beyond what the mayor is obliged by law to report mm -hmm. and in, with complete transparency. So given, given the structure and given the circumstances, um, it is more appropriate, I think in this case, for instance, a, a hot political issue, for instance, like teacher salaries, and to have the council tell, after collective bargaining, that we we reject the collective bargaining, and this has been appealed before, the, the fire department did with us, with us as well, is we reject your, your collective bargaining agreement and we want less money, in some cases, mm -hmm. to be given to these, because we don't agree with the union in this respect. That, it, which is actually technically within our power. Um, but you can do that under this charter. We can do that so under the charter. You can always say less, but can you, as a city council... We can, by the same constraint, can we say, we reject the, the contract that you negotiated and want you to give them more money, mm -hmm. right? And um, I personally would not feel comfortable in, in overriding in either case, a collective bargaining agreement. But you could, 
yeah, an agreement that's been signed to the but a proposal. If the mayor says, well, I'm going to, I'm going to have. Well, a, if they're in the midst agreement. of collective bargaining. Well, I can see you may not want to, you don't want to have a public discussion about collective bargaining. Maybe. Well, we can't. Yeah, we can't. Oh, you can't. Yeah, we can't. We can't have. But a, if you don't agree with the positioning and the posturing of the executive, share that. we can share that opinion with the mayor, and that's been done. You can share that opinion can, about. But would you share that opinion in the city council chambers, or would you share that? It would not be. You'd have to because collective bargaining by law required to be done, uh, not in public. <coughs> although you wouldn't know it these days, but yes, not in public. Um, we would have to do it individually with the mayor, which is what we have done. We have, uh, <coughs> some councils have shared quite candidly their opinion about how things should proceed. Or at least giving the mayor an opportunity to explain what the circumstances are in the intern. We would have to discuss that in executive session as he, he has done. He updates us on collective bargaining. <coughs> but that has to be an executive session, closed session. Those minutes can't be released until the mm -hmm. contract's uh, established. But even yeah. here, the city council does have a role because they can right. reject the, the appropriation right. for the agreement to amend. And, and you know, I just if I, if I may, I just want to tack on to what Bob said about the, the, the budget. In 1981, the city of Boston, the city council of Boston, and the mayor of Boston were in a fight about staffing and salaries. And um, it's also a strong mayor form of government. And what the, the Supreme Judicial Court said, the city council's authority is limited largely to a check on the mayor's executive function through a power of appropriation. Any money that's going to be spent by the mayor has to be appropriated by the city council, every penny, and so that's a huge that, that that's an enormous power. Was that decision though? Was that question before the court about the charter, or was that the question about the power of a city council in the state? It was talking about the power of the city council under a strong mayor form of government. In Boston. In Boston. But that would be yes. But, but that would be app uh, applicable to a strong mayor for government in other communities. That's right. Yes. Yes. You may have just made my point. I, we've been talking about our limitations that we can only um, <clears throat> subtract amounts from the budget as in the context of our charter, but that's actually Mass General Law right. that yes. dictates that. that Patty. Based on what you've heard tonight, and this has mm -hmm. been a very important and interesting discussion, do you, have you reached any conclusion? Of, um, I, I think I support the the, uh, the language, but it clearly the I, I don't think there's agreement. Um, I, you know, I think that even if this language was in the in the charter, I can see that perhaps the city councilors and um, Perhaps the council, council as well, might choose not to follow it. I mean, I think that I, I think Alisa made some good points. I guess what she said was, I think she articulated what I'm thinking. But you know, it, it's clearly there's not a, it's not a discussion among all of us here. There, I think it's been just me and Bill. A few of us are really sharing sharing it. So, um, but I think the, I, I, I think it's an important question about whether whether in fact when I vote for my city councilor, I'm voting for somebody who's truly in, representing the values and interests that I have and the vision that I have for the city, and that might include that you know collective bargaining agreements, it might be on labor, how you know people are treated, and wage theft, and whether or not we're using corrosive pesticides on our city property where our children play. And I, I guess I'm left with the question that should we not have a mayor, should we have a mayor who wasn't Mayor Nagowitz, but somebody entirely different, would you in fact have the power to do the things you've been able to do? Mayor Nakowitz shares the values of most of the city council. I don't think that the philosophical. Yeah, I, I do, and I, you know, I think it, the question really is, 
when he's not mayor and there's somebody else there, who we, our city councilors who what we vote for um, don't agree with the way that the mayor makes his decisions, um, I think there could be bigger conflict. Well, you, you're talking about checks and balances. Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, well, section one, four, powers of the city as it's defined in the charter, mm -hmm. subject only to express limitations on the exercise of any power or function by municipal governments in the Constitution or general laws. It is the intention and the purpose of the voters of Northampton through the adoption of the charter to secure for themselves and the government all of the powers it is possible to secure as fully and as completely as though each power were specifically and individually enumerated on this charter, which is to say Massachusetts law automatically establishes legislative authority to the council. And, it's in, and it doesn't have to be, and we're saying, the charter is saying, mm -hmm. we're not saying that to be redundant because mm -hmm. it's already embedded in this law. The checks and balances issue, I mean, we've talked about that in some, you know, the, the fiduciary oversight is a significant authority. It's, it's a blunderbuss. You're right. It's a, you know, the, for instance, the teachers are asking us to reject the budget in, its, in toto. In, should it come to that um, after the budget hearings and they haven't reached a collective bargaining agreement. Mm -hmm. That is within our authority. Mm -hmm. We can do that. It's up to the council whether they think that that makes sense and it's, it's an appropriate <coughs> way to respond. Mm -hmm. Or then you go back to the more subtle differences and the influence. Now everything that, that Council Klein has mentioned, there is, there will be, hopefully, a pesticide committee that is established by the council to review and make and set and to, to direct policy and recommend policy for how pesticides are used. Mm -hmm. There, we do, we are a sanctuary city. We do all the things as you said, some by mayor, some by the mayor, much of it by a lot of influence from the council. Now, the mayor may have been predisposed to turn us into a sanctuary city or not before. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that he wasn't moving on it all that fast until such time that, that the council started uh, researching and using the authority that it had. We closed our landfill, much to my objection, but that didn't matter. We closed our landfill because of legislative, by legislative fiat, basically, by law. And that was a huge fight. And in a confrontation with arguably the people who wanted the landfill closed, thought they had a recalcitrant mayor who was not going to accommodate them, and they went to their council who accommodated them. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to slap them personally, but that's fine. I you know where I fell on that one. But the fact is, is that it happens. We it, it is the mm -hmm. there if you end up with a really crappy psychotic mayor who suddenly turns out to be just like Donald Trump, the reason. For instance, why the two-year term for councilors and the four-year term for mayors allow you to vote for a council in quick response if you don't if you think they're too accommodating and appeasing to a mayor that you object to, <coughs> and then also, not for nothing, the mayor is subject to the laws of the state and of the federal government. They are not they don't they are not exempted by executive privilege, unlike some. So. They are they're accountable in that respect as well. And, so. and, and if I may, the other way of looking at this is a majority of the people in this city voted for a mayor who may not share your values, but he shares a, the values of a, a majority of the of voters in this community. I didn't say I didn't share the values. No, no, no. What you said. If, yeah. if they, no, no, no. If there was a mayor with whom you didn't share the values oh, with, oh, that yeah. mayor will have been elected by a majority of the voters in the city. And, well, and just that, like our president. I, I get that. That mayor may not share your values, but that mayor shares, mm -hmm. perhaps shares values with the majority yeah. of the voters. I mean, that's the other yeah. way to look at this well. rogue mayor that you're concerned about. Yeah, I think this is a really fascinating and vital discussion, and I hope it continues. Um, I, I personally, and it doesn't seem like the group supports Bill's proposed language here, um, and I'm also having a hard time imagining the language that would fit into our city structure that would address all of these things. Um, so I hope we can continue to talk about this, but I don't think that what's before us is really going to be resolved. 
And you're specifically referring to the uh, Newman's proposed yeah. language. Yes. Okay. But I, I and I agree that it is an important discussion, and, and I think we should. Um, I think we should continue. And I think that um, we probably heard enough today. We probably exhausted. Um, The, the avenues uh, that we want to explore tonight, but but I think it, it is important uh, enough for us to to uh, come to a vote on on that or some amended version of right. what he has suggested. So we'll we'll, we'll continue this discussion uh, at a later meeting. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, uh, our next uh, our next item is following up on our lengthy discussion at the last meeting about uh, four uh, new concepts that we have uh, uh, talked about adding as subsections, and I believe they properly go under Article Eight as all that pertains to elections. Um, and I'd like to take these um, one at a time. Um, the first is lowering the municipal voting age to 16. Is there a, a, a motion to uh, approve that? So moved. Okay. All right, we discussed this last time. Um, are there further issues that people want to discuss tonight? Before we vote on any. Yes. I just want to clarify that we're just voting on lowering the age. We can continue a discussion about who can run for office yes. at another time. Yes, that is a related but, uh, but, but separate issue to be decided uh, at, uh, at, a, you know, at a different meeting. And, and Bill, Bill, to fill you in on the, the Question that was raised about if we there's reference in the charter to various city offices being filled by election from among the voters. The question was raised: Well, could then a 16 or 17 year old be elected mayor, for example? And I think there's some concern about uh, legally whether someone age 16 or 17 could sign the contract. Mm -hmm. Is that? Well, it's also the concern, of course, is what the state would recognize as an executive officer. Um, in that we're making a municipal decision about allowing them to vote, we can't change the state requirements for age minimums. And I don't know what those are, if they exist, I assume they exist. However, in Kansas, they realized they never put any age limitation. They had like four 12-year-olds running for governor at one point, and there was nothing they could do about it because they actually did not Established. So I don't know if the state has limits. Um, you have to be eligible to vote. Right. But That's state for this is statewide. Correct. Yeah. Not. So I don't. I, I never understood, and I don't think it's established that this authorization would allow um, 16 to 17 year olds to run for office insofar as that they would not be recognized. They, they don't have the right to vote in state elections. They would not have. So you have the, the definition of voter is a registered voter. And it's not registered in the state. No, a registered voter. And any voter shall be eligible to hold the office of mayor. So we'd have to do that's some tweaking of the definition of voter. Yeah. That language is in the charter. That's in the that's charter now. But okay. the question I think is whether state law prescribes right. the age uh, qualification. qualification for any office, any elected office. Not that I'm aware of. Our charter well, controls that. That's what I mean. Yeah, and well, and I, the voter choice people said to me that state law says any eligible voter may run for any seat. So that would suggest that, that the 16s could run. However, it is, it is the case that whatever we do here is going to have to go to the legislature right. anyhow. Yeah, so I don't right. think we should worry about this no. particularly. And most of the um, special acts 
that I looked at, all of them had an exemption that they had to be 18 to vote away the office. Right. We would just have to tweak some language, though. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, personally, if you ask me, I'd say if the voters voted for them, then they should be elected. But if if there are, we run up against issues about whether they, it's true, whether they're not, unable to sign a legal binding contract, although they used to be able to sign up for Columbia Record Club, but <laughs> so, it doesn't exist anymore. So, <laughs> one dollar. Yeah, that's right, one dollar. A lot of albums. <laughs> Yes, I, I just to underscore what Lynn said, the, the, uh, the initiative petitions from other towns, and I think um, there, were, there are several of them that are before the legislature, um, do specify an exemption for under 18 for holding office. But that doesn't, you know, that doesn't say that we have to adopt it, but that is a consideration that I think would be that we would need to do uh, you know, legally research whether. I can tell you right now that any hope you have of getting this through the legislature will depend on excluding 16 year old from becoming the mayor of Northampton. That will well, never well, fly through the legislature. I'm going to tell you that right now. You're yeah. confident. Yeah. I am totally I, I confident. Would that. Yeah. I would it's going to be hard enough to get this. It's hard enough yeah. to get the yeah. right yeah. to vote. But I, I, I would like it that if we do stipulate an age, that we justify the reason for that. Not just that this <coughs> stand a chance of the legislature, but that the concern is principally about the ability to sign legal contracts. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sure 18 year olds should be yeah. allowed to vote. That seems yeah. 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 adequate and appropriate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Until such time the state comes around and decides that 16 year olds can vote. In which case then that's up to them to figure out how they do. Sir. Sir. Six year olds can serve. Sir. Right. And would be quite entertaining to have a 16 or 17 year old in council. Yeah, I think that would be a good thing. But I worry about them signing contracts. Right. That would be my but we don't sign contracts. Although, Not I'm sorry, I take that back. We do uh, We do sign land takings and things like that. We have to sign our votes. So I don't know. Okay. But my feeling, these are valid points. My feeling tonight is we're voting on the question of whether we want to recommend that the voting age in Northampton be lowered to 16 mm -hmm. for me as four elections. Okay. Further discussion on that? I've got a question. Okay, mm -hmm. we need, uh, we need a roll call on this. Um, Stan Logan, yes. Robbie Sullivan, yes. Dylan Gaffney, yes. Sam Hopper, yes. Bob Bullrays, yes. Patty Healy, yes. Lynn Simmons, yes. Council Foot. Yes. Okay, so that's approved eight, eight zero. <coughs> The next one is a recommendation that the city adopt rank choice voting for municipal elections. Uh, move approval. Second. We also had extensive discussion on this last time, but other, other discussion tonight? Well, I'm just thinking back to, it's been especially Pam bringing up, um, you know, can we do all of these at once? So, I mean, I would recommend that, you know, you want these things, but knowing that it's too much, uh, am I making sense? So you mean whether the legislature would be amenable to having all these Or ones? whether the city could handle doing great choice right. voting and vote by mail and under 16 all in the same, all the same. I mean, not that they're even going to go through at the same time, but is, you know, do we need to pick and choose or do we just want to um, state our choice. wishes? Can we rank choice? Rank choice amendments. Question for Alan, though, but didn't you tell us that you know we can recommend all we want, but once it goes to the city council, that they have the ability, they can they go can just up, laugh right? and say, "Yeah, we're done with so this." So we can just go ahead and say, say we want all this. I would recommend uh, putting yeah. in everything okay. that, yeah. that, right. that you want That's and let the councilors. Because we're just going to tell them they have to do the dirty work. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, <laughs> And they want to do it. That's what I needed to hear. They want the authority. <laughs> that, that's a valid point that you raised, Bobby, but I think it's our feeling that, that this is our opportunity to express mm -hmm. what we feel is the right direction for the city and that there will be many stops along the way, right. starting with the right. city council to sort that out. And I think in the report you can tell them that you recognize that perhaps this all can't be implemented at once, 
but these are the things over the next 10 years that we'd like to see happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I remember you, you say, saying that at the same time. We can even rank these. <laughs> we can even go in and say, you know, we rank, we rank these as the most important choice. and the other things we really would like, but you know. We don't even know when ranked choice voting is going to happen. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And it might be a lot easier than it is now. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, I know Molly has a particular interest in this. Um, she's not here, so I, I, if anybody has any thoughts about this, um, go ahead and voice them. Otherwise, I'd like to, to wait until the first the June 4th meeting when Molly's here to maybe reach some specifics on how we're going to do this. But, Go ahead. I, I would okay. just recommend uh, reaching out to the housing authority um, because they, well, mo many of our subsidized housing are all managed by the housing authority. They're a federal agency. We actually have very little authority over mm -hmm. them. That's another issue for another conversation. But, uh, but at least as far as um, soliciting participation among the residents within the housing authority, they have translation services as well. So there may be a way of disseminating the request through that. Okay. And Peg Keller can. And Peg Keller, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And through some of the tenant associations right. directly yeah. instead of going through administration. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, one of the, as we were just as you talked about this here, I was thinking. And Molly and I had a side conversation quickly at the last meeting. Um, we, it's not lost on me that we can reach out to these underrepresented communities in one specific area that I feel they generally are unrepresented is if, they're, um, if they have trouble reading English. And we invite them to come to the polls and vote that day. They can't actually read the ballot. Yes. Um, and so that, I think that's one way we can discuss could we um, put something in our charter that requires us to have at least Spanish or maybe Khmer or whatever the other languages are that are um, have the highest percentage in Northampton and maybe our municipal ballots are printed in other than English or literature that we put out. Another thing to consider is at some point when we have a, if we have a dedicated meeting to this issue is to convene at JFK. Um, it's more accessible, more parking. Um, it's more proximate to um, uh, Hampshire Heights, Florence Heights, and Meadowbrook, among other things. Um, just <coughs> for accessibility issues. So, and it also, you know, reaches out deeper to the community rather than just having People who feel that there are there's a large cohort that feels uncomfortable about coming down to a municipal office and to, have, to hearings like this. So. Yeah, I think the location as, as well as the time could be a consideration. It's not just uh, it's not just reaching out to uh, racial groups that are non-white, but also to low-income right. uh, uh, segments of the community and others that may not feel a, an evening meeting is. All right, well, these are all good ideas. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll, and again, I know Molly has a particular interest in this. Let's, uh, we'll discuss this further at the June 4th meeting. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about tonight is um, the summer schedule. Um, uh, I, I want to keep this group cohesive so that if people have times, if they know they're going to be out of the city, that would conflict with our particularly July and August meetings, um, uh, we may, uh, I'd like to try to accommodate that as much as we, as much as we can. Uh, and maybe we, we, we try, again, as I said last time, I, I think we, we're proceeding at a good pace. We're five months into this, or well, four months, and we've actually been working. So we've got another uh, seven, seven to go. But uh, maybe we can um, reduce our meetings to one for July and August as the City Council does. But what um, are there specific conflicts that people know about already with meetings in July or August? I will be away for the June 18th meeting. I'm away from the 14th to the 25th for work. And then I'm also away July 31st through August 6th.
our next kept on schedule, our July meeting will be the second and the sixteenth. I'm waiting for July first. Yep. That's the fourth of July week. Yep. Yeah, I'm worried about recalls. Okay. All right, well how about this then? I'm already hearing that the July fourth week is probably not a good week for us to meet. Um, how about if we say that we will meet um, in July only on July sixteenth? Okay. And August, uh, uh, Dylan, did you just say that you're away the first full week? Yeah, the first full week. Okay. Other, do others have August plans yet? I'm sorry? I have no idea what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing yet this summer? Sorry to hear that. I know. <laughs> um, uh, I, well, I, I too am going to be away that week. So um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to propose then that we, we have um, one meeting in July and one meeting in August. It will be August 23rd, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead with our two June meetings as scheduled and we'll scale back to July 16th and August 20th. Right away uh, again on uh, September 3rd, the day after later. What, what day is in June? We're going to meet uh, our normal schedule June 4th and 18th. Okay. June 4th, June 18th, July 16th, and August 20th. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Any other um, business tonight? Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Again, we adjourn 843.